Mark chapter 3 verse 25 says, And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Jesus spoke these words in response to accusations from the scribes, who were suggesting that he was casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. Their logic was absurd, as Jesus clearly pointed out. If Satan were casting out Satan, his kingdom would collapse. The principle that Jesus declares here goes beyond the context of that specific confrontation. It's a universal truth. Division leads to destruction. This truth applies not only to the kingdom of darkness, but even more to the church of God. As believers in Christ, we are part of one body, the body of Christ. Romans chapter 12 verse 5 tells us, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Unity in the body is essential for its health and its effectiveness in carrying out the mission of the gospel. A divided church cannot stand against the pressures of the world, the flesh, and the devil. The enemy knows this, and he is relentless in his efforts to divide believers. He sows seeds of discord, jealousy, and pride among the brethren, seeking to tear apart the unity that Christ has given us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul urgently appeals to the church, saying, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. This is the standard to which we are called. We must speak the same truth, hold to the same faith, and be united in Christ if we are to stand firm. Division within the church is one of Satan's most effective tools for weakening the body of Christ. When believers are at odds with one another, whether over doctrine, personal preferences, or unresolved conflicts, our focus shifts from the mission of the gospel to internal strife. Instead of standing shoulder to shoulder as soldiers in the army of Christ, we waste our strength in battles against one another, as Paul warns in Galatians chapter 5 verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. The warning is clear. Division consumes us from within, rendering us powerless against the external attacks of the enemy. But division does not only weaken us internally, it also damages our witness to the world. Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 verse 21, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Our unity as believers is meant to be a testimony to the world of the truth of the gospel. When the church is divided, the world sees hypocrisy and confusion instead of the love and power of Christ. In fact, many unbelievers reject Christianity not because of the gospel itself, but because of the divisions and scandals they see among those who claim to follow Christ. How then are we to avoid the sin of division? and walk in the unity that Christ calls us to. First, we must remember that true unity can only be found in Christ and in His truth. We cannot compromise the essential doctrines of the faith for the sake of superficial harmony. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 4 through 6 says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, and through all, and in you all. This is the foundation of our unity, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We must be united in the essentials of the faith, in our commitment to the gospel, and in our allegiance to Christ as Lord. Paul's instruction to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 19 sheds light on this. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. This verse reminds us that sometimes divisions reveal who truly holds fast to sound doctrine. While we are to strive for unity, we cannot achieve it by sacrificing the truth. True unity is built upon the foundation of the gospel and the authority of Scripture. Yet, within that commitment to truth, we must also practice love and humility. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 2 instructs us to walk with all lowliness and gentleness with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. Unity does not mean uniformity. There will be differences among us, 
in matters of secondary importance. But in all things, we must show love, patience, and grace toward one another. Philippians chapter 2 verses 3 through 4 commands us, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. It is pride that causes division, but humility that fosters unity. When we find ourselves in conflict with another believer, the path to reconciliation is laid out for us in Scripture. Jesus commands in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. This is the heart of Christ, restoration and reconciliation. We must not let bitterness or unresolved conflict fester within the body of Christ, for these things breed division. Instead, we are called to pursue peace and to be quick to forgive, as we have been forgiven in Christ, as Paul reminds us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. The church is called to be a witness to the world of the transforming power of Christ. In John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus said, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. When we love one another, we display the reality of the gospel to a watching world. But when we are divided, we undermine our witness and give the enemy a foothold. We must also be aware of the spiritual nature of the division that seeks to tear us apart. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul reminds us, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. The division that arises in the church is often fueled by spiritual forces that seek to destroy the work of Christ. We must be vigilant in prayer, recognizing that the battle for unity is ultimately a spiritual battle. The enemy wants nothing more than to see the church divided and ineffective. But we are not left defenseless. God has given us His Word and His Spirit to guard us and guide us. We must be committed to prayer, to seeking the Lord's wisdom and strength to overcome division. As James chapter 1 verse 5 reminds us, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Unity is not something we can accomplish in our own strength. It is the work of the Holy Spirit within us. In Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 through 23, we are told that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the qualities that foster unity within the body of Christ. When we are filled with the Spirit, walking in His power, we will bear these fruits, and division will have no place among us. As we reflect on Mark chapter 3, verse 25, let us take seriously the warning of Christ. A house divided cannot stand. The church must stand firm, united in truth and love, if we are to be effective in our mission and faithful to our calling. Let us guard against the schemes of the enemy that seek to divide us, and let us pursue the unity that Christ prayed for. May we, as his people, be of one heart and one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel and standing firm against the darkness of this world. In doing so, we will bring glory to God and be a light to those who are lost in need of salvation.